Over the years, and in a couple previous videos on this channel, I've built some Raspberry Pi retro emulation consoles in fancy cases just like this. And while the end result always looks very clean and performs decently well, have we been overthinking it this whole time? Satisfy your need for speed with the all-new Viper VP4300 NVMe Drive. Featuring blistering fast PCIe Gen 4x4 connectivity, you'll be burning rubber with speeds of up to 7400 megabytes per second. The VP4300 also includes both an aluminum and a graphene heat sink, so you can choose the one that's right for you. Or use one on each side to double up your cooling performance. Available in capacities of up to 2 terabytes, along with 2 petabytes of ride endurance, the Viper VP4300 is the ideal drive to help turbocharge your PC. Click the link down in the video description to learn more. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. As I mentioned, I've built a fair number of Raspberry Pi consoles in my day, and this one is by far my favorite one. This is the NES Pi 4 case from Retroflag, and on top of having a Raspberry Pi 4 inside, this is also one of the best Raspberry Pi 4 cases you can buy. Not only does it come with a pretty dynamite heatsink and fan for your Raspberry Pi 4, it also features a fully functional cartridge with an SSD caddy inside, meaning that you can hot swap these cartridges with different operating systems or even different catalogs of games. And while this setup for some may represent the pinnacle of retro gaming in a pint-sized console, today I'd like to present an alternative, introducing the Aerofara Aereo 2. While the Raspberry Pi 4 does boast some impressive specs for its size, such as the Broadcom quad-core ARM Cortex-A72 processor running at 1.5GHz, it also still pales in comparison to modern x86 platforms. The Aereo 2, on the other hand, is running an Intel Gemini Lake quad-core Celeron J4125, with a 2GHz base clock and a 2.7GHz boost, as well as Intel UHD 600 graphics. Now, both of these platforms do support 8GB of DDR4 memory at their maximum. However, again, it is a win for the Gemini Lake platform, with the Raspberry Pi 4 maxing out at 8GB of LPDDR4 3200MHz, the Gemini Lake supports up to 8GB of dual-channel LPDDR4 2400, giving it overall much more bandwidth to work with. Now obviously the extra power is going to come with some added cost. The Aereo 2 runs $240 on Amazon right now with the 8GB of RAM and 240GB of storage. Meanwhile, you can get the Raspberry Pi 4 in this exact configuration with 4GB of RAM and 120GB of storage for around $143. And if you're interested in either one of these, I will have links down in the video description to Amazon where you can pick up everything for yourself. Now then, let's get on to why I think the Aereo 2 should be your retro console of choice in a package that's literally less than half the size. So first up, let's just talk straight up performance. Like I said at the beginning of the video, there's nothing really wrong with the Raspberry Pi 4, especially in this very cute form factor. It's able to run pretty much every single 90s retro console up to around Nintendo 64 and PlayStation 1, in which it does have some hiccups with some of those generation titles. So if your enthusiasm for retro gaming sits squarely in the pre-64-bit days, the Raspberry Pi 4 is a pretty solid offering. However, I like to include all of the 64-bit era and even jumping into the GameCube era, and that's where the Aereo 2 comes into play. Jumping from the quad-core ARM to the Gemini Lake J4125 gives us significantly more CPU processing power to play with. And since the Nintendo 64 and GameCube are both fairly CPU intensive, especially for these lower powered platforms, that means I can play the entire Nintendo 64 library. In fact, I was able to run every single GameCube game I attempted at native resolution with FXAA enabled at 30 FPS. The rest of the specs between these two systems are virtually identical, with both of them featuring Gigabit LAN, AC Wi-Fi at both 2.4 and 5 GHz, as well as Bluetooth 4.0 on the Aereo 2 and Bluetooth 5.0 on the Raspberry Pi. The Aereo 2 is likely going to win in the storage speed department, however, where the Raspberry Pi relies on a micro SD card or USB to SSD adapter. I'm actually not sure of the interface on the Aereo 2, but I'm betting it's probably either mSATA or an M.2 SATA connection. And of course, there's only one way to find that out. So let's go ahead and tear this thing apart, and then I'll show you what it can actually do. So first off, the system is pretty well put together with no visible screw holes at all. Now, one thing I don't like is the I.O. is actually protruding out of three different sides of this. So we've got an SD card reader, two USB 3.0 ports, and then the power button here on the side. 
We've then got a DC input, another USB 3.0, full-size HDMI, gigabit LAN, and our audio out, as well as a reset button. Now, I'm actually not sure if that is just a physical reset button, like reboot the system, or if there is a ROM on here, including the pre-built Windows image. That would be pretty cool. And moving around to the third side of the system, we can see a VGA port as well as an exhaust vent. And finally, back to the bottom of this case, there are four rubber feet on here with what I can feel to be screw holes on the corners. So we're gonna remove these rubber feet and hopefully remove the four screws. And that is indeed the case. Okay, I stand corrected. There are seven screws in total to remove. All right, the front and rear plastic panels just kind of click right off there. And I'm assuming the system is going to go out just like that. All right, into this system. And the first thing I notice is this fairly substantial aluminum heatsink with a pretty nice low profile blower on it. We've also got an M.2 2242 slot for the storage. So the storage is upgradable in this system if you need a little bit more. Now, like most Intel embedded systems, the CPU is soldered to this board, and in this system, the system memory is soldered as well. However, that's not necessarily a bad thing. You see, the Aero 2 includes a full 8GB of memory, which is the max that the J4125 can support, meaning there are no upgrade paths for you to take anyway. Right here under the M.2 slot, we can see the Wi-Fi antennas terminate directly into the board, meaning that we are stuck with the onboard AC3165 chipset. However, that's again, not necessarily a bad thing because there's not a lot more that you could add to this board outside of what Intel has already given you. So overall, a very tidy and well put together system. So let's go ahead and put this thing back together and I'll show you what it does when we get into Windows. Sorry about the rapid set change here. I ran out of time that day to finish filming the video. Anyway, first off, let's take a look at a couple titles running on the Raspberry Pi. We're running RetroPie on here with a 1.8 GHz CPU overclock and a 650 MHz GPU overclock. To not make this review too long, we're going to go with a couple traditionally taxing N64 titles on the Raspberry Pi, starting with Perfect Dark. Performance is decent here, sitting in the low to mid 20s most of the time, but there are a ton of graphical issues when running this game on the Pi. Text rendering is a massive issue in this emulator, appearing fuzzy and unreadable in most cases. Parts of the screen also like to glitch out at random, breaking visuals and making it pretty difficult to play. There are also plenty of frame drops and jittery frame times. While it's far from the worst experience I've ever had, the game is far from perfect, and for many people would be considered unplayable. The other game I tried out here was The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time. Natively, this game runs at 20 FPS on the Nintendo 64, or 17 FPS if you have the PAL version. While during gameplay, the RetroPie can hit 20 FPS, it struggles to stay there consistently. And just like Perfect Dark, there are a litany of graphical issues that keep this game from being enjoyable. Text is fuzzy and blinks in and out seemingly at random. Frame times drop when performing certain actions, or even when in light combat. And don't get me started on the performance during cutscenes. You thought the early game cinematics were long before? Just wait until you have to watch them at 8 frames per second. The kicker here is RetroPie is running both of these games at their native resolutions. No upscaling is taking place, and we're only doing some light FXAA in post-processing to help smooth out some of the image. While these are demanding games inside the emulator, performance is still very disappointing. While the Pi can play 16-bit libraries perfectly, it is still a mixed bag when you step up to 64-bit systems. Moving on to the Aereo 2, let's take a look at those same games, but this time running inside Windows on Project 64 version 2.3. I've enabled 1080p scaling, FXAA, as well as Super 2x texture smoothing. Again, Perfect Dark is a fairly difficult title to emulate, so we see the frame rate hovering in the mid-20s most of the time, but with peaks up to 30 in some less demanding areas. The texture smoothing, anti-aliasing, and 1080p resolution really shine in this game, especially compared to what it looked like when running on the Raspberry Pi. Additionally, there are no graphical issues to be found, and the game is perfectly playable. Ocarina of Time is the same story, but with a frame rate cap of 20 FPS. The Aereo 2 is able to flex a little bit here, keeping that 20 frames per second solid the entire time, without a hint of stuttering or slowdowns. And again, let's compare the visual quality on this hardware compared to what we were getting out of RetroPie. Which one would you rather have plugged into your TV? But the whole point of this video was showing off some GameCube footage, so let's play a little bit of Wind Waker. While I was hoping to do some resolution scaling, that just wasn't in the cards for the Aereo 2 due to that TDP limit. 
so no 1080p visuals for us here. But at native resolution, with FXAA applied in post, the game doesn't look too bad and is perfectly playable holding 30 FPS most of the time. Combat was incredibly smooth and consistent, and even when there were slowdowns, they weren't game-breaking at all. Most of the time, the slowdowns would occur during transitions or cyclone warps, and at worst, would still be between 20 and 25 frames per second. Super Mario Sunshine performed equally as well, holding a consistent 30 FPS almost the entire time. Again, even though we're only displaying at native resolution, the game still plays remarkably well. In fact, Mario seems to have the most stable frame times out of any of the titles I tested. I also got to play some Time Splitters too, the cult classic from the developers of GoldenEye and Perfect Dark. Simply put, this game is amazing, and ran at its native speed of 60 frames per second on this hardware. Just like the other games, there were no graphical issues or significant slowdowns to speak of. In fact, I think the slowest I ever saw this game run was around 45 FPS, making it an incredibly smooth gameplay experience. Now, don't get me wrong in this next section. I was more than happy with the performance I was seeing out of the J4125, but I was curious to see if there was any more oomph to be had under the hood. I took a look at the BIOS to see if there were any TDP adjustments to be made, and, well, this BIOS is about as bare as they possibly come. So it looks like we are going to be locked at that 10 watt TDP on the Celeron system on chip. Normally I'd be fine with this limitation if we had some other way to manipulate CPU or GPU speed, but we don't have any options to limit CPU power nor to disable turbo. That means we won't have a ton of options for increasing visual quality as there's just not enough headroom with that GPU. One more thing I wanted to mention was the options you have if you want to run the Aereo 2. Out of the box, it does run Windows 10 Home, and that's likely good enough for most use cases. You could easily install another operating system if you wanted, though. In fact, RetroArch on a Linux build may not be the worst idea in the world. And lastly, while this is a PC, and it does do emulation pretty well, don't expect to be playing the latest AAA titles on it. In fact, don't expect to be playing any games from the last decade on it. Here's Far Cry 2, published in 2008, running at 1080p on its lowest settings. I think most people would agree that 10 FPS is just not enough. Wrapping things up here, while the Raspberry Pi has been the darling of the set-top emulation crowd for quite some time, it's not always the perfect solution, especially if you want to run games from the 3D era. While the Pi 4 in the NES Pi case definitely wins the looks and nostalgia department, the Aereo Fara Aereo 2 is quite the looker itself, with some performance chops that puts it well out in front of everyone's favorite single board computer. At $240, the Aereo 2 is well equipped for most emulation needs. A quad-core x86 CPU, 8GB of dual-channel memory, 240 gigs of storage, along with Wi-Fi and Bluetooth connectivity. Even though it costs around $100 more, it far outclasses the Pi in performance and software options, as well as the whole coming pre-assembled and with Windows installed thing. If you want to pick up either of these devices for yourself, I will have Amazon affiliate links down in the video description. Make sure to go give those a look. And on your way down there, make sure to drop this video a like and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. Follow me on Twitter at Craft Computing to keep up with my daily shenanigans like this. And if you like the content you see on this channel and want to help support me in what I do, consider joining the Patreon or Floatplane. Links are both down in the video description. As a bonus, you'll get exclusive access to my Discord server, where you can chat with myself and the other hosts from Talking Heads. Thank you all so much for watching this one, and as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys. for today is from Rogue Ales and Spirits in Newport, Oregon, and it is the Newport Lights IPA, a West Coast IPA brewed with El Dorado hops. In a recent Talking Heads podcast, which, by the way, check us out every Wednesday night at 8 p.m. Pacific time, I said how if we had to pick a state beer, it would probably be an IPA, and based on that criteria, I would probably pick something from Rogue since they have one of the widest distributions of Oregon breweries. Now, I bought a four pack of this about a week ago, and it kind of backs up my claims that Rogue may be one of the best IPA makers in the state. This is a 9.8% double IPA with 60 IBU. And while their six hop or 10 hop IPAs likely get wider distribution, this beer is just fantastic. If you wanna know what a Northwest IPA should taste like, this is it. The beer is so clear, you can see my face refracting through it, and the flavor profile in this is just phenomenal. While the aroma on this one is a little bit more subdued, I'd like a little bit more citrus right up front. This is a wonderfully thick and smooth and real earthy style IPA. It's just good.